why it is so hard for mankind to be happy. Three sources of human suffering, namely the superior force of nature, the disposition to decay of our bodies, and the inadequacy of our methods of regulating human relations in the family, the community, and the state. 64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Welcome to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. My name is Igor S.F. Walker. Today, we look at Civilization and Its Discontents by Sigmund Freud. So how about you slow down and relax? Reduce all that noise for just a bit. Make that choice and decide to listen. In this video, we look at one of the last of Freud's books written in the decade before his death, also considered his most brilliant work. It seeks to answer several questions fundamental to human society and its organization. So stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I have in use that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. What influences led to the creation of civilization? Why and how did it come to be? What determines civilization's trajectory? Freud's theme is that what works for civilization doesn't necessarily work for man. Man by nature, aggressive and egotistical, seeks self-satisfaction. The impression forces itself upon one that men measure by false standards that everyone seeks power, success, riches for himself and admires others who attain them while undervaluing the truly precious things in life. And yet, in making any general judgment of this kind, one is in danger of forgiving the main fold variety of humanity and its mental life. An object first presents itself to the ego as something existing outside, which is only induced to appear by a particular act. Further stimulus to the growth and the formation of the ego, so that then it becomes something more than a bundle of sensations, i.e. recognizes an outside, the external world. Mother's breast will reappear only as a result of baby's cries for help. The tendency arises to dissociate from the ego everything which can give rise to pain, to cast it out and to create a pure pleasure ego, in contrast to a threatening outside not-self. Now, the limits of this primitive pleasure ego cannot escape readjustment through experience. Originally, the ego includes everything. Later, it detaches from itself the external world. <clears throat> the fact is, that the survival of all the early stages alongside the final form is only possible in the mind. And that is impossible for us 
to represent a phenomena of this kind in visual terms. Life as we find it is too hard for us. It entails too much pain, too many disappointments, impossible tasks. We cannot do without palliative remedies. We cannot dispense with auxiliary constructions. There are perhaps three of these means, these remedies. Powerful diversion of interest, which lead us to care little about our misery. Substitutive gratification, which lessens it. And intoxicating substances, which make us insensitive to it. What the behavior of men themselves reveals as the purpose and object of their lives. What they demand of life and wish to attain in it. The answer to this can hardly be in doubt. They seek happiness. They want to become happy and to remain so. <clears throat> now there are two sides to this thriving, a positive and a negative one. It aims on the one hand at eliminating pain and discomfort and on the other at the experience of intense pleasure. In its narrow sense, the word happiness relates only to the last. Thus human activities branch off in two directions corresponding to this double goal according to which of the two they aim at realizing either predominantly or even exclusively. What is called happiness in its narrowest sense comes from the satisfaction, most often instantaneous, of pent-up needs which have reached great intensity and by its very nature can only be a transitory experience. Suffering comes from three corners. From our own body, which is destined to decay and disillusion, and cannot even dispense with anxiety and pain as danger signals. From the outer world, which can rage against us with the most powerful and pitiless forces of destruction. And finally, from our relations with other men. It is no wonder if, under the pressure of these possibilities of suffering, humanity is wanting to reduce its demand for happiness, just as even the pleasure principle itself changes into the more accommodating reality principle under the influence of external environment. If a man thinks himself happy, if he has merely escaped unhappiness or weathered trouble, if in general the task of eliminating pain forces that of obtaining pleasure into the background. Unbridled gratification of all desires forces itself into the foreground as the most alluring guiding principle in life, but it entails preferring enjoyment to caution and penalizes itself after short indulgence. Voluntary loneliness, isolation from others, is the readiest safeguard against the unhappiness that may arise out of human relations. The man who is predominantly erotic will choose emotional relationships with others before all else. The narcissistic type, who is more self-sufficient, will seek his essential satisfaction in the inner workings of his own soul. The man of action will never abandon the external world in which he can essay his power. The interests of narcissistic types will be determined by their particular gifts and the degree of instinctual sublimation of which they are capable of. When any choice is pursued to an extreme, 
it penalizes itself in that it exposes the individual to the dangers accompanying any one exclusive one life interest which may always prove inadequate <clears throat> success is never certain it depends on cooperation of many factors perhaps of none more than the capacity of the mental constitution to adapt itself to the outer world and then utilize this last for obtaining pleasure religion circumscribes these measures of choice and adaptation by urging upon everyone alike its single way of achieving happiness and then guarding against pain there are many paths by which the happiness attainable for man can be reached but none which is certain to take him to it when as a result of voyages of discovery men came in contact with primitive peoples and races to the Europeans who failed to observe them carefully and misunderstood what they saw these people seemed to lead simple happy lives wanting for nothing such as the travelers who did visit them with all of their superior culture were unable to achieve latter experience has corrected this opinion on many points in several instances the ease of life was due to the bounty of nature and the possibilities of ready satisfaction for the great human needs but it was erroneously attributed to the absence of the complicated conditions of civilization when people began to understand the nature of neuroses which threatened to undermine the modicum of happiness open to civilized men it was found that men become neurotic because they cannot tolerate the degree of privation that society actually imposes on them and in virtue of its cultural ideals and it was posed that a return to a greater possibilities of happiness would then ensue if these standards were abolished or greatly relaxed mankind is proud of its exploits and has a right to be but men are beginning to perceive that all this newly won power over space and time this conquest of the forces of nature this fulfillment of age-old longings has not increased the amount of pleasure they can obtain in life has not made them feel any happier one gets this enjoyment by sticking one bear's leg outside the bedclothes on a cold winter's night and then drawing it in back it seems to be certain that our present day civilization has not inspired us in feeling of well-being but it is very difficult to form an opinion whether in earlier times people felt any happier and what part their cultural conditions actually played in that question a bit of truth behind all this one so eagerly denied <clears throat> is that men are not gentle friendly creatures wishing for love who simply defend themselves if they are attacked but that a powerful measure of desire for aggression has to be reckoned as a part of their instinctual endowment the result is that their neighbor is to them not only a possible helper or sexual object but also a temptation to them to gratify their aggressiveness on him to exploit his capacity for work without recompense to use him sexually without his consent to seize his possessions to humiliate him to cause him pain to torture and kill him homo homini lupus 
Now, who has the courage to dispute it in the face of all the evidence in his own life and in history? Anyone who calls to mind the atrocities of the early migrations, of the invasions by the Huns, or by the so-called Mongols under the Genghis Khan, and Tamerlane, of the sack of Jerusalem by the pious crusaders, even, indeed, the horrors of the last world war, will have to bow his head humbly before the truth of this view of man. Civilized society is perpetually menaced with disintegration through this primary hostility of men towards one another. Their interests in their common work would not hold them together. The passions of instinct are stronger than reasoned interests. Culture has to call up every possible reinforcement in order to erect barriers against the aggressive instincts of men and then hold their manifestations in check by reaction formation in man's minds. Civilizations expect to prevent the worst atrocities of brutal violence by taking upon itself the right to employ violence against criminals. But the law is not able to lay hands on the more discreet and subtle forms in which human aggressions are expressed. The time comes when every one of us has to abandon the illusory anticipation with which in our youth we regarded our fellow men. And when we realize how much hardship, how much suffering we have been caused in life through their ill will. Men certainly do not find it easy to do without satisfaction of this tendency to aggression that is in them. When deprived of satisfaction of it, they are ill at ease. If civilization requires such sacrifices, not only of sexual, but also of the aggressive tendencies in mankind, we can better understand why it should be so hard for men to feel happy in it. In actual fact, primitive man was better off in this respect, for he knew nothing of any restrictions of his instincts. The antithesis between a minority enjoying cultural advantages and a majority who are robbed of them was therefore most extreme in the primeval period of culture. Over and above, over and above the obligations of putting restrictions upon our instincts, which we see to be inevitable, we are imminently threatened with the dangers of a state one may call la misery psychologique of groups. This danger is most menacing where the social forces of coercion consist predominantly of identification of the individuals in the group with one another, whilst leading personalities fail to acquire the significance that should fall to them in the process of group formation. La misère psychologique. The chronological sequence, first instinct, renunciation, due to dread of an aggression by an external authority, this is, of course, of course, tantamount of the dread of loss of life and love, for love is the protection against these punitive aggressions. Then follows the erection of an intellectual authority and instinctual renunciation due to dread of it. That is, dread of consciousness, of conscious. 
In the second case, there is the equivalent of wicked acts and wicked intentions. Hence comes the sense of guilt, the need for punishment. The aggressiveness of conscience carries on the aggressiveness of authority. When authority prevented the child from enjoying the first but most important gratification of all, aggressive impulses of considerable intensity must have been evoked in it. Irrespective of the particular nature of the instinctual deprivations concerned, the child must necessarily have had to give up the satisfaction of these revengeful, aggressive wishes. The sense of guilt produced by culture is not perceived as such and remains to a great extent unconscious or comes to expression as a sort of uneasiness or discontent for which other motivations are sought. The different religions at any rate have never overlooked the part played by the sense of guilt in civilization. The upbringing of young people at the present day conceals from them the part sexuality will play in their lives is not the only reproach we are obligated to bring against it. It offends too in not preparing them for the aggressions of which they are destined to become the objects. Sending the young out into life with such a false psychological orientation is as if one were to equip people going on a polar expedition with summer clothing and maps of the Italian lakes. The development of the individual is ordered according to the program laid out by the pleasure principle, namely the attainment of happiness. And to this main objective it holds firmly the incorporation of the individual as a member of a community or his adaptation to it seems like an almost unavoidable condition which has to be filled before he can obtain this objective of happiness. Individual development seems to us a product of the interplay of two trends, the striving for happiness, generally called egoistic, and the impulse towards merging with others in the community, which we call altruistic. Neither of these descriptions go far beneath the surface. The things are different in the development of culture. Here, for the most important aim is that of creating a single unity out of individual men and women, while the objective of happiness, though still present, is pushed into the background. It almost seems as if humanity could be most successfully united into one great whole if there were no need to trouble about the happiness of individuals. So in every individual, the two trends, one towards personal happiness and the one towards unity with the rest of humanity, must contend with each other. So must the two processes of individual and of cultural development oppose each other and dispute the ground against each other. The fateful question of the human species seems to me to be whether and to what extent the cultural process developed in it will succeed in mastering the derangements of communal life caused by the human instinct of aggression and self-destruction. And there you have it, civilization and its discontents. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it, read, 
never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management even further, then do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. I thank you. Love and respect.